Yeah, that's bad. Um, we'll, we'll decide after church or after we get done, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. Apologize for not getting started right on time today. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 if you want to turn there. I do want to open with a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll get started. So let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for your word that you preserve for us to have, for us to look at and study from today. We pray that it would guide our thoughts and our actions, and Lord, that we would be obedient to what you uh, have spoken, but also what your Holy Spirit leads us to do based upon your word. So Lord, give us that guidance, um, and let us be receptive to it, and we pray it in your Son's name. Amen. All right, chapter 5 of Ephesians. Uh, this is the section of text that some people have been waiting for. Um, Freddie, you have to be quiet through this whole passage today, okay? <laughs> no, I say that jokingly. Um, we do want to look at the, um, the truthfulness of what Paul says and make sure that we are not taking things or that we have not taken things in the past out of context because this is a passage that if we're not careful, we can pull out certain phrases or certain words and it, it actually just um, totally does away with the correct meaning of what Paul was trying to communicate. So, so let's uh, start reading and I actually want to back up to verse 18, if we could, of chapter 5. But before we start there, I want to back up to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. And actually, before we start there, <clears throat> I want to go back to chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> so chapter 4, verse 1 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now skip over to chapter 5, verse 1, keeping what we just read in mind. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now flip over to verse 20, I'm sorry, verse 18. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Donnie, I've got a little bit of an echo. Um, thank you. Uh, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are all members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However... 
Let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, um, interesting passage of text that probably for the sake of households, relationships, um, the marriage union probably is one of um, several important passages that we should look at and probably should look at pretty often. Um, it is not self-standing in terms of this should not be taken as only this passage of text. And that's why we backed up into chapter 4 and we looked at the beginning of chapter 5, but when you get down, we also have to reference back to Genesis as well. So we, we cannot take this as a standalone. This is in conjunction with every other passage of text that we would find in the Bible. So if we start trying to, to pull out certain things and only use them, then we're going to be looking wrongly at, at the text or at the Scripture. So let's make sure we look at it in the full context of what we've already studied and what we'll look at today. So question one from verse 21, what does it mean to submit to one another? And can we answer this truthfully without answering what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit from verses 18 through 21? And can we answer it without going back to Ephesians chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5? So what does it mean to submit to one another in context of the passages that we read? So let's first talk about, let's do it this way. From verses 18 through 21, what is Paul talking about? The overall thought in those four verses, what is he talking about there? 18 through 21. Worshiping God. Worshiping God, okay. Praising Him in songs and... Okay. Look at the end of verse 18. Yeah. Yeah. So in what we do, don't be filled with something else. He uses wine or, or alcohol as the um, as the opposite to just kind of draw a comparison. Again, I think we talked last time. This passage of text, the full meaning of this is not just don't get drunk. That's not what Paul's trying to say. He is saying that it is wrong to be drunk, but he's it, what he's trying to get across here is instead of being filled with that be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes into verse 19 and he says, this is what happens when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We address one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We sing, we make melody to the Lord in our heart. We give thanks always and for everything to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what it means in this passage as Paul defines being led by the Holy Spirit again, this is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Now we know what the fruit of the Spirit is as well, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all those things. Those do not contradict what Paul is saying in verses 18 through 21. They are just a further explanation of those things. So Paul says, if we are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which we would say as a believer... When we get saved, to use that terminology, when we accept Christ our Savior, say we're going to follow Him, then we're filled with the Holy Spirit, which means then that this should be our actions going forward. So we should not be filled with other stuff, but we should be filled with the Spirit, which then means that we're going to address one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. We're going to make melody in our heart, um, we're going to give thanks for everything, and we're going to give thanks to God, and we're going to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Those are things that are going to happen when we have the Holy Spirit living within us. So, now let's go back to chapter 4. Let's get the overall teaching of it. So verses 1 through 3. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, 
So we got to stop there and we got to say, Paul's urging us to do something here. He's teaching us there's something important, and that's to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have. And then he goes on to explain what that is. With all humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So he's saying, I'm urging you to walk in the manner you are worthy of being called. In other words, if Christ has called you to be saved, you're to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're to walk worthy of the manner in which you have been called, which means that you'll walk with humility, you'll walk with gentleness, you'll walk with patience, you'll bear one another in love, and you will be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Those are things that we will be willing to do if we're going to walk worthy of the manner in which we have been called. Then we look at the beginning of chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what's the overall teaching we find in those two verses? Follow Christ. Be an imitator of God. Christ imitated God. We follow Christ. And then he gives us that explanation of what Christ did. Christ loved us and gave himself for us. And because he gave himself for us and he was the perfect sacrifice, then the result of that was that it was a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. God was pleased by what Christ had done. So when we take these three passages and we put them together, then we are to find that it, when we become saved, then we are to let the Holy Spirit fill us, which then means, going over to chapter, uh, verse 18 of chapter 5, we find all those things that we are supposed to do that we've talked about. Those are an outflow of an inward change that's happened. And then in first part of chapter 4, he says, this is the, the manner worthy of the calling that you have. Humility, gentleness, patience, love, and eager to maintain unity. Those things are all part of the manner worthy of which you have been called. And then beginning of chapter 5, to be an imitator of God. Those things all have to be in our life. And when we do that, if we're imitating Christ, what Christ's offering and sacrifice was, was pleasing unto God, which means if we do these things, then it will be pleasing unto God. Now, if we go back to verse 22, and really go back to verse 21. Because remember, as Paul starts identifying um, particulars, there's an overall teaching that he has first. So verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Who is Paul speaking verse 21 to? I'm speaking to the men. They are in the group, yes. Yeah. Believers in general at this point, yeah. He's speaking to all believers. Now that's key that we say believers because we can't hold an unbeliever to this understanding because they've not been filled with the Holy Spirit. They do not know what it means to have um, this peace in their heart. They don't, do not know what it means to be able to make melody to the Lord with their heart. They do not know what it means to always be able to give thanks and for everything to God. So we, we can't hold an unbeliever to that status. But a believer, now again, this is not a believer by name only. This is not a person that just says, well, I believe in Christ. This is someone that believes but also follows, which means they've let the Holy Spirit have control of their life, or they're trying to let the Holy Spirit have control of their life. I'm not saying they're perfect, not saying they're not going to mess up, but they are trying to let the Holy Spirit have control of their life. Understanding the will of the Lord? Yes. So, in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is a statement that is for all believers, regardless of gender. Now, verse 22, 
moves into some of the particulars of verses 21 and above. Okay? So this is breaking it down into some um, different relationships other than just believers across the board. All right? Now, before we get to verse 22, what does it mean to submit to one another? As he addresses in verse 21. the way people are taking it, the way that it was, the way that submit is people take it as you have to just buckle up and get, get under to, but I don't think that's what it means. Okay. What does scripture say it means? What does the word submit mean? Well, that's what I'm asking y'all, Don. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you can't ask the question back. I'm asking you. It doesn't mean to... <laughs> What does Scripture say that it means? It means you put the other first person before yourself. Okay. I'm not disagreeing with any of those answers, but what does Scripture tell us that it's submitting? What does Scripture here tell us that it's saying? Okay. It's sort of like a chain of command in service. You have Christ as the leader, and then you go down to the general, and you go down to the... Be careful. You go down to the <laughs> chain of command. Okay, I'll take chain of command out of the conversation, because I don't want to use that reference. I know what you're saying, but... Okay, Scripture says reverence. Okay. What does Paul say in verses 18 through 20? Be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Yeah. All of these things that we've just covered, having the Holy Spirit living within us to where the outflow of our heart is in response to what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do, is the act of submitting. We have let God have control of our life. When we let God have control of our life, we will submit to one another. And it will be in the form of singing songs and spiritual songs. It will be making melody to the Lord in our heart, which is going to outflow to those around us, which means they're going to see a guy or a gal that's, that's joyous, that's giving thanks to God regardless of the situation that's going on. All of those things mean submitting. Now, when we submit to one another... We have to go back to verse 2, chapter 4. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What does it mean to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit? How many spirits are there? One. One Spirit. So if we are eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, what does that mean should be going on among us as believers? Let the Spirit lead not only our thoughts, but our actions between each other. And if we do that, what will we, what will we find? You're absolutely right. And when we do that, what will happen among believers? Unity. Unity. Yeah. You see how all this ties together? Like you can't take this stand alone. We can't just say, okay, we're going to submit because there's a, I'm going to use your terminology, but there's a chain of command. That's not, that's not what Paul's saying in this. He's saying, yes, we are to submit ourselves to each other, but that starts by us giving ourselves to God, believing on Him accepting the free gift of salvation, accepting the Holy Spirit that comes and lives within, and then taking that and seeing what it does inside of us, which then makes us have an outflow of one 
Spirit, one God, one Lord. Which means that outflow then to another believer should look really close to the same, right? Because there's not two spirits. If there was two spirits working among believers, then we would find times when there's not unity, wouldn't we? If there was two spirits. Am I making sense at all? Okay. But there's not two spirits. There's only one. Right? So that one spirit then means that among believers there should be a unified voice and a unified action toward each other. Now, understand that there are people who are not believers that walk into church all the time. I I understand that, and you know that. And there are people that are not believers in your families, maybe extended families or somewhere down the line. Which means there are going to be times that there are difficulties in this world because we are not only interacting with believers. We're interacting with unbelievers too. Theoretically, members of the church should all be believers, right? That's the standard. You're to be a believer in Christ, following Him. Which means then that as members of a church, there should be a unity among the members of the church because there's one Spirit acting among all of those members. And the outflow of that Spirit having control of our thoughts, actions, lives means then that we would all have the same thing going on within us and outflowing from us. Now, as Paul says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That would mean that we hold something in very high regard. And what would that be? Last few words of verse 21. reverence for Christ. We want Christ to be glorified. We want to hold Him in high regard. And so in doing that, we submit ourselves to each other, which should be, if we're believers and we're letting the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, then it should be somewhat easy to do because those around us as believers will have the same type of actions and and thoughts as we do because we're believers, they're believers, one spirit, outflow of what's went on inside of us is now happening, coming out of us, which means it should be somewhat easy to do. And when we do that and the world sees a united front among believers, then we're reverencing God and Christ because they see a tie that binds, which is Jesus Christ, salvation through Him. Now let's look at question two. Has the concept of submitting been misused? If it has been misused, what could it possibly have led to in our society? Okay. That's one thing. Um, and I, Divorce among who or what? Yeah, it's not, when we hear the word divorce, we're immediately t- thinking about husband and wife, right? right? Is there a divorce among a body of believers sometimes? Yes. We call it a church split. Mm-hmm. It's really a divorce because we're saying we can't get along. Now, let me say this there are churches that choose to take a group of people within their church and go plant another church. That's not a church split and that's not a divorce. That's a completely different conversation. So don't think that every time a church comes out of another church that it's a a divorce or a split. That's not always the case. There are church plants that come out of another church. Those are actually, can be good things. So, has this submitting been misused? Yes. yes. What does uh, when we misuse it? How does it get misused? What gets 
or it gets overlooked. The fact that he says Christ says to submit and to to submit as Christ would submit to the church, and a lot of people don't don't do that. They think submit means just to give in no matter what. Okay, I want to back you up. As Christ would submit to the church? No, as the church should submit to Christ. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't do that. So when we don't submit, what are we asking people to do? Change our way of thinking. Change their way of thinking, is that what you said? They to what? So we're asking them not to then be led by the Holy Spirit to be believed, but to be led by who? By me, right? Or you, or whoever is asking that. Because if we're not willing to submit, then basically what we're saying is we're not willing to be led by Holy Spirit. And then if we're asking other people to agree with us, and we're not submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit, then we're asking other people to be led by us, not by Holy Spirit. Do you think that happens in the church today? Yes. Not, and when I, when I say that, please understand, I'm not talking about, you all hopefully know this by now, I'm not necessarily talking about this church. I'm talking about church body of Christ in the United States. And I want to narrow it to that United States because I don't know much about the world. I mean, I know, but not much about the world around. United States, yes. Because uh, otherwise we would not find churches going against what Scripture says. No, I think that the churches like theology and all of the, you know, how you post things for, you know, they have their agendas and they want to push their agendas on the churches and stuff like that. Um. So, will the Spirit ever lead us to contradict Scripture? No. no. Will it ever lead us to contradict an interpretation of Scripture? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we have to be careful with that. So sometimes when we read commentaries, we've got to be careful that we don't take the commentary as Scripture, but we take Scripture as Scripture. We take the commentary as someone's interpretation of it. It may be right, but it also could be wrong. And so we have to be careful you know, on those things. And we also have to be willing to... to take into account that we may have misstudied Scripture along the way. So even though we thought it right, we could have got messed up somewhere along the way because maybe we took in something that generationally was taught and it wasn't necessarily taught from text, but it was just taught, this is what we do. And, and so we have to always go back and, and if someone brings up something that's different than what we thought we knew, we do have to be willing to at least go back and say, let's look at that in Scripture, which is why I kept pushing you guys when, you, when I ask you, what does it mean to submit? And you're giving me great answers, but you weren't going back to Scripture and telling me where it came from. We have to go back to Scripture and be able to say, this is where my thoughts were formed from. And we need to be able to do that, because if all we say is, what I've always heard, or this is what I was always taught, then we're leaning on someone else, which may be right, I'm not saying they're wrong, but we also need to go back ourselves to Scripture and say, this is what I heard, and they pulled it from here, and this is why I believe that they were right. You see the difference in the two? So, uh, let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. I think you could probably flip one page and be there. Um, and I want us to take into account who Christ was and is. So look at Philippians chapter 2, 
um, and go back to verse 5 of chapter 2 of Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Does that sound like submitting? But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. We see that word humility in there again, right? Or humbleness. So in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because death and death on a cross is two different things. Death could be by natural cause, and it just had a heart attack and he died. But Paul is saying, he went to death, but he went to death willingly on a cross, which is different than just dying. Therefore, verse 9, Therefore God has, exalt, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, did Christ ever submit to anyone? To God, God, right? Did He submit to anyone else? I want to say yes, but you're going to ask me too. Everyone. That's what I was thinking. He submitted. I, I don't know if you would really call it submitting to everybody because He gives His life up for people, Maybe even fair. sinners. Did, was there not a form of submittance when he came to the earth in a human form? Yeah. When he came to the earth as a baby who was helpless? When I say helpless, understand as, a, as an infant, had to have someone feed him, had to have someone clean him, had to have someone dress him, keep him warm, all those things. Is that not a form of submittance as well? And he did it willingly, knowing what was going to happen. Do we ever struggle with that? Letting someone else care for us? <laughs> this is that point, Freddie, where you're supposed to be quiet, I think. <laughs> Don't we? Let's go a little bit older. Um, did he submit, someone brought this up a minute ago, did he submit to parents when he was able to start making some decisions on his own? You're talking about when they went back to the temple and found him in the temple. How about before that? Though? When he was still with them. And? He, had, he still depended on his parents. And he submitted to their will as far as teaching him and even though he already knew it, you know, that's, that's hard to understand. It is. He knew all of that, yet his parents, I don't figure they were 100% right all the time. They were imperfect people, right? But he still submitted to them. Yeah. What about, uh, now we think, um, because Joseph was a carpenter, so we think that he would have learned the trade that his dad knew because he would have been trained up to, to do that. So as he built things for other people, do you think he ever submitted to those he was building things for? Or did he just say, I'm building it the way I want to build it? Doesn't matter what you think. That's <laughs> Did Christ ever submit to his apostles? 
wash their feet? Did he submit to Roman army? He submitted to when he made the statement about the money and he said surrender unto Caesar is what Caesar is that submitting? It would be submitting to a government authority. Yep. So uh, why did he do all of that submitting? Object lesson, I guess. Do I? Object lesson. Object lesson? And and we call God's plan his starts with a W. God's will. God's will. Right? You remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. From the time he came to this earth until the time he left, what was he about doing? Father's will, right? So we find these submittance points throughout. Now, you never got married, so we don't have that relationship to, to look at, except his bride, which we call today the church, that he was married to. And we see that the church is supposed to submit itself unto Christ, which means that we would do what the will of Christ ultimately God, would be because Christ is doing the will of the Father. So we find these submittance points all along the way. So what do we learn then from this? Is submittance us doing what someone else wants us to do? Or is it, is it us doing something that's in line with God's will when someone else is trying to lead us in God's will? Did I say that right? I don't know, but if you did, I didn't catch it. <laughs> is us doing, is us submitting, doing what someone else wants us to do, even though they may not be doing what God wants them to do? Or is us submitting, doing what someone else wants us to do when they're trying to lead us in the path of God? See, there's a, in going back into Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That statement carries with it a responsibility that the husband has. And that is to lead the wife in the path of righteousness or of, of what the Lord's will would be. Which means then that when we start trying to say... Wives, you are to submit to me. We better make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do. And if we do, then there's a really good chance that we're not going to say, wife, you better submit to me. Because there's going to be a, going back to uh, going back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility. Has there ever been a humble person, person with humility that's ever said, you better do what I want you to do? No. So we've got to keep in mind that, that as we read, I say this often to, to guys, verses 22 through 24 I've said before, probably shouldn't be read by guys, but if we have the right mindset and understand that there's a responsibility that guys have in verses 22 through 24, then we need to read verses 22 through 24. If we can't understand that there's a responsibility that guys have in verses 22 through 24, then we don't need to read it, because all we're going to do is interpret it as that's what they're supposed to do. And that's not what Paul intended for us to interpret that as. 
So looking at question three, looking at verses 22 through 24, who did Christ submit to in order for Him to lead the church? Who must the husband submit to in order to lead the wife? So who did Christ submit to in order to lead the church? God. God. Who must the husband submit to in order to lead the wife? Christ. Christ. Could Christ have led the church without submitting? No. No. He might have tried, but he would have done it wrong. And it would not have been a glorifying body of believers to God, but it would have been one that would have been probably a story of such as Sodom and Gomorrah or the days of Noah. Right, right. Can the husband lead the wife without submitting? Kind of a trick question. Can't lead them in the way of righteousness. He can lead, but that doesn't mean it's right. But if he's if he's submitting, I don't think that the wife is going to care to submit to her husband if he's doing it the right way. You know the the greatest thing that can happen. greatest thing that can happen in a marriage relationship is for the, the husband to make it easy for the wife to follow God and vice versa. The greatest thing that a wife can do is make it easy for the husband to follow Christ. But those go hand in hand. Um, question four then. If a man is viewing leadership in the home properly, trying to do it properly, will he ever feel threatened by his wife being equal to him? No. He won't. There'll never be a threat from within. There may be a threat from without. I'm talking about outside the marriage relationship. There may be a threat even from a child if the child is rebellious. But there won't be a threat from, from husband and wife. So looking back to verse 21, we've already talked about this. Who is to submit to who? And what group of people is he talking to? Christians. Believers. Believers. Gender specific? No. So there's a submittance that goes on among believers. And we have to remember that husband and wife, assuming both are believers, there's a submittance that goes on just because they are both believers. So when we see this statement, we can't take verse 22 without reading verse 21. Because verse 22 gets into some finer details, but verse 21 is an overall statement. There's a submittance that goes on among believers. And if both husband and wife are believers, then we have to remember they're both believers. And so there's a submittance that goes on among that. Now, when you get down to a finer detail of a decision within a household has to be made. Um, Both voices are equal. And going back to verse uh, or question four, if a man is leading the, the household properly, trying to do it properly, he will never feel threatened by an answer that the, the wife would give. He will never feel threatened by a question that the wife would ask. But he will understand that there is a mutual understanding that we are trying to find God's will together. And so when a question comes up, it's a valuable question. And we need to spend some time talking about it and answering it together. Now, ultimately, if, you know. You know, many uh, a husband has quoted this scripture, you know, the man of the head, wife, submit yourself to your husband. And 
they stopped there. Yep. And they didn't go ahead and finish the rest of this chapter we're in. Now how the wife, husband is to love the wife and care for her and protect her as much as he had protected him on himself. And the, the love he is to have for her. Many a wife would like to have this husband. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And sadly, even among those who have claimed to be believers, this husband hasn't existed sometimes. Right? Even among those who claim to be believers and followers of Christ, this husband has not existed. And because this husband hasn't existed, probably what else hasn't existed? He's not fully given in. The wife has probably not existed either. Because doesn't the husband's actions affect the wife? Now, who has the greater responsibility there? Husband. So think about question six. Think about the culture in which Paul was living in and the freedom that believers were now beginning to enjoy in Christ. How could both of these statements by Paul have been needed in order to guide and instruct these families as followers of Christ? So, let's talk a little bit about the culture. We're going to end with this today. Let's talk a little bit about the culture that was there. Roman culture, even among Jewish culture to some extent, uh, what was the wife viewed as? Equal say in everything? Someone said it. Property, I think. Yeah, property in most cases, especially in Roman culture. Jewish culture, kind of that way as well. Almost viewed as property. Okay? Now we have the church being birthed and growing. And Paul is talking to a believing group of people, but what have they come out of? Either a Jewish culture or a Roman culture, one of the two. And, and those intertwined a lot as well. So you, you have, even though they are believers, you have these individuals coming out of a culture where wives were no voice at all. You do what I tell you to do. Almost like a slave-servant kind of mentality. I'm not saying that's the way they should be today. I'm just saying that that's, that's what it was. It was wrong, but it's what it was. God never, go back to Genesis, God never intended that relationship, by the way. Okay? That was never the intent of, for God, in, for God to, never intent for us that God would, well, I can't even say that right. It was never the intent God had for that relationship to exist. Not where they were considered property, but that's what it was. So as wives come out of that, if you had to put on a pendulum, freedom, and on this side you have property or slave type, and on this side you have total freedom to where they do whatever they want to do. When you come out from under this slave side, what's your tendency to do? Is it to just kind of come down a little bit, or is it to swing all the way the other way and greatly enjoy this freedom I've now got, and I'm going to take advantage of it, right? That's typically what happens. Now, there are some cases where it doesn't happen. Uh, you can go back to, to after the Civil War, and you find that there were some slaves that didn't know how to deal with freedom once it was granted to them. And so they stayed and actually became workers for their owners. They just stayed there. They didn't know what to do with it. So there, there are some cases where it doesn't happen. But the, the natural tendency is if I'm here, I'm going to swing all the way this way. And we have to be careful because eventually then what happens is it swings back. And it ends up going back instead of landing in the middle somewhere. Paul was probably speaking to this pendulum that had swung. And he was now trying to get the pendulum in the right place, which is what God's design was. So from both aspects of husbands loving your wives and from wives respecting or submitting to your husband, because if you get down to verse 33, you find an overall summary. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Um, Paul is speaking to both audiences now that are believers, and he's trying to get this pendulum correct. 
Because for the husband coming out in this society, the pendulum was here. She is my property. And now the husband has to understand, okay, she is not my property, so I've got to let her make all these decisions and everything. But then what that means is he doesn't want to take any responsibility for the actions, which means he says, ah, she made her decision. She made her bed, let her lie in it, right? But that's not what God designed either, was it? No. No. We have to remember that there is a greater responsibility within the family unit for the husband to lead in the way that God designed him to lead. Doesn't mean that the wife is exempt from every decision that's made, but there is a greater responsibility there. And so Paul's trying to align both of these groups of people that are in the category of believers who are both supposed to be submitting to believers. And Paul's trying to align both of these groups in the right place because culture was telling them something much different. What does culture tell us today? (laughs) Bad things, right? Culture doesn't tell us to align the pendulum the way God wants it to be aligned. It's really interesting if you look at... um, TV shows going back to the, I'll say, 60s. And you look at um, kind of the sitcoms or the the, what was designed to be family shows. If you start at the 60s and you work your way forward and start naming some TV shows that come on. And think about the relationship that was depicted within those shows. Go back to the, I think it was the 60s where Leave it to Beaver was on. Y'all remember that, right? Family unit, right? Did, uh, um, what was the dad's name? Ward. Ward, thank you. Um, Warden June. Did Ward always get everything right? It's a different one. Ward didn't always get everything right, but at the same time, there was a family unit that was depicted there. I'm not saying it was completely biblical. It wasn't designed to be a biblical show, but it was designed on family morals. Flash ahead from that. What's the next show you can think of? Andy Griffith. They were about the same time, weren't they? Somewhere in there? Yeah, Andy Griffith was a little bit different in that, that there wasn't a family unit, so to speak, but there was an extended family unit that where Aunt was not married, she then came in and took up a mother role, both for Andy, if you remember in some of the shows, she raised him, and then she was taking up that role for um, Opie, because Andy's wife, what happened to her? Otis was. Not a good example, by the way. And the mayor, and the mayor was also um, not a good example either. Main characters were not. No. Steve told Charlene that she would marry him. He'd make her a good husband, but he wouldn't be here but once a week. Right. <coughs> yeah, not a, good, not a good example there. But if you remember, Andy's wife had died. Yeah. And so Aunt steps in to help, help raise. Um, so let's go forward from there. What's the next one you think about? Brady Bunch. Brady Bunch was in the... Dick Van Dyke. 70s, Dick Van Dyke show. That was probably around the same as Andy Griffith was. Father Knows Best. That's all kind of in that. Yeah. Who? Yeah, Edith and Archie Hoppers. Well, we're not using that one. (laughs) So you get in the 70s, you have the Brady Bunch. So two family units that I don't really know what happened to the, were they divorced? Did it say? Did it ever say what it happened? Never, never said. said. But anyway, they bring two together, and they have struggles in doing that. Um, Partridge Family. Okay. Beverly Hillbillies. Okay. You opened this up. I did. <laughs> Y'all know a whole lot more shows from those eras than my younger group does, so. 
raised with three girls. I was actually a father and a friend or somebody. Yeah. I don't know. It's against the Big Joe Junction was about in that time. Father knows best. I don't know. Yeah. My three sons was in there. Flash ahead to the 80s. Let's just fast forward to three companies. <laughs> that was in the 80s, right? Probably in the 80s. Three's Company, where did things start going wrong there? Is there a family unit depicted at all? No, they're all on their own. Every man for himself. And um, it was the first time, it never was said out loud, but it was the first time that there was a depiction of the possibility of someone being homosexual. Jack Ritter had to pretend to be really? gay to live with the girls. To live with the girls. It's the only way he could stay in the house. Yeah. The landlord had to think that he was gay. Yeah. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep. I was out of the Um Think about, y'all remember the show Home Improvement? Yeah. Uh -huh. Tim Allen? Yeah. Was Tim Allen depicted as the head of the home? He just lived there. <laughs> he was kind of made out to be a goofball. So you find the degradation of the family unit being depicted on on TV. That's like everybody loves Raymond. Think about, um, and I never watched this. I just knew what was going on in it. But um, was it called Roseanne or Roseanne Barr or whatever her show was? Yeah, but who was ahead in that? She was. It was terrible. Now the Waltons was a Walton was a family show. That was back in the 70s, 80s, somewhere in there. You had a little house on the prairie that was 70s, 80s, family wholesome. Yeah, those were good shows. Too. Um, I still watch those two shows. Yeah. You get into the 90s, um, you have a show by the name of Full House that shows up which was husband's wife died. Full house, yeah. Husband's wife dies. Uh, you have two guys that move in, help raise. Um, not too bad, you know. You have something that, a life event that happens. Someone has to step in. Um, there was a show, I can't remember. Kirk Cameron was on it when he was a teenager. Um, Yep. Growing pains. Growing pains. Who was who run that show? Yeah, you do. I just said his name. Kirk Cameron was always pulling something. Now he was getting caught, but he was always kind of the guy that was. He kind of run the house a little bit. Um, was he the kid in the show? He was the kid in the show. Yeah, the teenager that was always kind of getting in trouble, but yet he was always pulling one over on somebody, which kind of shows us today what happens in houses sometimes. Kids run them. My point in all of that is, as we think about it, culture, if we're not careful, begins to define family instead of God's word defining the family. And so that's why, I, you know, back in the beginning, I kind of pushed you on. I said, so what does it mean to submit? And hopefully now what you'd say is, well, let's go back into Scripture and let's look at what it means to submit. Let's look at what Paul says submittance is like. Let's look at what Holy Spirit in filling a person's life means for that person. Because we need to know what this tells us about those things. We need to know, instead of everything that we've always heard about what a wife's supposed to do and a husband's supposed to do, like, let's go and find it in Scripture of what they're supposed to do. Because we can pull out certain things, and we do it sometimes, and sometimes we even do it for marriage ceremonies if we're not careful. But we pull out certain passages, and we use them, and we make them fit what we want them to fit. And that's not right. Because ultimately... 
A marriage ceremony should not be about, okay, wife, you've got to submit to your husband, husband, you've got to love your wife. Ultimately, it should be about you two have got to follow God. And if you don't, then none of the rest of the things will work out right. But if you do, then things will start to fall into place. But you've got to get that right first. Um, and that begins with each one of them being a believer and follower of Christ. And we can't expect marriages to work out well unless both are believers and followers of Christ. So we'll, uh, we'll end there. We'll pick up next week. Actually, we will not meet next week because we have the community Thanksgiving service Monday night, and then we will not have services Wednesday night. Um, so it'll be two weeks from today when we will meet again. And we'll pick up here with question seven, yes. So we'll probably have to review a little bit to get us back in the right mindset. But uh, we could what? Do question 13 and just go from there. That gets us through quicker. <laughs> Mary, I'm glad you're back. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Let's make sure we don't let culture define our marriage. And we can't let culture define what we teach going forward either. We looked at this, um, and I've thought a lot about this, because in Psalm chapter 78, we looked at this yesterday when um, me and Chase and Donnie sat down together. Psalm chapter 78, in verse 5, Um, we talk about teaching and training the next generations. There's a truth in here that I've missed in the past. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them. Right? We've talked about that a lot. The next generation has to know. But here's the next phrase of that. The children yet unborn which means we have to train the generation that's alive today, but we have to train them to train the next generation, the unborn. And maybe we've stopped with the next generation sometimes, and we need to make sure we're training them to train the next. So it's an interesting thought to think about and how we would do that. Let me uh, pray for us and we'll, we'll close. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this